You understand? It is a really, really busy foreign policy time. It is extraordinarily busy. And we have um, cabinet officials, national security advisors, the vice president sprawling all over the world, racing as fast as they can. And so to deal with foreign policy today, what's strange is you see both a combination of whack-a-mole and people trying to run in, run faster and faster. That's not strategy. That's being very reactive to what's coming up. And it's, a, it's one of the real problems I see. So when you look at then what's going to happen in 2014, when I step back and say, well, what would be if I were advising the president or if I were in a, in, a, in a role saying, well, you know, let's forget about the domestic arena for a bit, but think about how do you get smarter? How do you position America's interest in equities uh, in a better place down the road? Probably it's going to be very, very hard to, to uh, desist in racing to solve crisis after crisis around the world. We've got things in Africa we haven't talked about, Latin America. Obama just had the handshake. I was on MSNBC talking about the handshake with Raul Castro. There's a lot of stuff this administration can't even begin to take on, even if it wanted to, because the personnel and people aren't there. There is no envoy for Cuba, which they would need. Uh, to do, and, and, and uh, even though I think it would be a very important issue. So in, in, in my mind, we, we are caught in a reactive trap. Even though President Obama, uh, no matter what people think about him, is trying to imp impose, and, and so far in my view, largely failing, but he's trying to impose a strategic design on top. He has said we need to pivot from the Middle East, which is costing us lives, costing us treasure, but yet that part of the world will not be at the edge of America's economic future. Asia will be. So we need to rebalance our resources, not completely withdraw from the Middle East, but we need to stop the hemorrhaging of resources in the Middle East and need to begin looking at how you position US forces, and not just US forces, America's economic presence, and cabinet officials. And one of the interesting things was, I don't know if many of you know Bob Zellick. Uh, you remember Robert Zellick? Robert Zellick was our US trade representative, and he was our Deputy Secretary of State. Uh, he served in the Reagan administration, and then he was also in the um, uh, uh, George, well, he was in, in all the Bush administrations, but he was in the uh, Deputy Secretary of State in the George W. Bush administration. And in that time, he gave a very famous speech on China, encouraging China to become a responsible uh, international stakeholder. Uh, but at that time, Bob Zellick was about the only guy and he was at the deputy secretary level who was spending any time in Asia. He would go to the ASEAN meetings. He would go meet China. He would do the bilaterals with Japan. He would go to Korea. He took his picture with a panda bear. He later became, of course, president of the World Bank. Um, but he was it. And I remember asking him at an Aspen strategy group session when he was still in the Bush administration, are you the only one doing Asia? And he then appropriately you know, given the good bureaucrat he was at the time, said, no, we have many people working on that inside the Bush. And then he walked over to me and he says, yes, I am, and it's criminal. <laughs> and, and, and when you look now at the amount of man hours and time, some of you work in schools and universities and companies, you know what FTE is, full-time equivalent. There's a lot of FTE time of the Obama administration now just in people going to Asia, appearing at meetings, doing bilaterals. And so part of the presence and the shift to Asia is, in fact, sending people over there to demonstrate presence. And I look at that as to be uh, significant and important. But that's part of the, the shift that Obama's tried to do. He's also, in other ways, I think, done some impressive things that haven't gotten much uh, credit. Uh, he. I think there were many who believed in the Bush administration that the kind of global commons in nuclear and WMD materials had sort of fallen and that there was not uh, as, as much global attentiveness to the question of the materials and weapons and systems that go into chemical weapons, nuclear weapons, biological weapons. And uh, he and Joe Biden, Joe Biden really carried the load on this. Uh, managed a really impressive global summit in Washington of leaders from all over the world uh, committing to uh, new, to sort of generally, you know, to, to raise the allergy, if you will, to the proliferation of these systems. So he's tried to do that and impose that as sort of a moniker. That's why when the Syrian nuclear, when the Syrian chemical weapons issue occurred, I would go on television and say it's not just about the use of these systems. It's about Obama seeing this as a defining issue for his administration and part of his legacy that maybe people aren't paying attention to t today, but he will be looking at it later. We'll talk about, I know you're from whether he did a good job or not, but I knew it required him to take action because he and Biden had invested so much uh, in 2010 in that, in that nuclear materials and WMD materials summit. Um, Obama has also 
to a certain degree, inherited. Many people have saw him as a very continuous president from the Bush presidency with drones, with kind of a militant and martial position on you know, the, the uh, uh, global war on, the so-called global war on terror. Uh, he certainly hasn't been soft uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq, but then he said, you know, these, these wars are hemorrhaging. So he did draw down in Iraq. It looks like unless we get a deal uh, with the Afghan president, we will be drawing down at some level. And we're gonna be, you know, when you consider we had 100,000 troops, in Afghanistan, and, and the most will have 8,000, and we may have zero uh, uh, coming up at the end of 2014. That is going to be interesting. And so when you ask the question in 2014, that Afghan problem, just like Syria, uh, which you know probably much better than I, are, are parts of the world that aren't silos. The Afghanistan problem is not a silo unto itself. You know, the Turks, the Chinese, the Indians, the uh, uh, Iranians are all involved uh, inside Afghanistan despite the warring factions there. These are fascinating places that internally are both civil wars and sectarian conflicts on top of, on top of which are proxy wars between regional players struggling over the control. And we injected ourselves inside Afghanistan uh, in my view, I was very, very uh, opposed to the Afghanistan surge uh, to put my cards on the table because I saw us unprepared to sort of deal with the broader geopolitical realities of that and that countries like Iran and China saw America as weakening itself, not strengthening itself. Well, you know, and it, I'm a, the kind of realist that think before you deploy forces and you know, large-scale uh, expenditures in trying to pop up a state, you need to ask at the end of the day, are you leveraging Amer American power to do more and more good things in the world, or are you ca capping and constraining American power in such a way that you actually embolden uh, other players in the world? And I used to, my joke when I would open uh, 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 talks in the past, it's not so relevant today, but I would tell people, and this was a true story when I was in China on one occasion, talking about the director of policy planning at Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs. This was years ago when we were uh, in the middle of the, the real buildup in Afghanistan and Iraq, and, uh, and, he, and I said, well, you know, we're, we're in China, you know, tell me your secret, tell me your, you know, secret sauce, what is China's grand strategy in the world? We all really want to know. And he says, well, our grand strategy is how to keep you Americans distracted in small Middle Eastern countries. Uh, and because in that way, the rest of the world looks really easy. And what's been interesting to watch is as U.S. forces have come out of Iraq, we haven't done a lot with them. But as we've been drawing down in Afghanistan and clearly sending the signal that we're no longer going to be there, it's been interesting how much many of the other pieces of the world have begun to move, particularly Iran. And it's not that we have the forces. It, 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 if you look less tied down, if you look less militarily overstretched, it changes the calculus that other countries have. And to some degree, China, which was on a global charm offensive at one point when we were really dragged down, being nice to everybody, China's become a, our, our, best, our best ally in promoting US and Asia because it's become such a bully. It, you know, in the absence of that distraction in the US, the US has invested a lot more presence in Asia. It's one of the smart things I think uh, President Obama's gotten right, is realizing that power is not just deploying a military you know, in a very binary way and getting a result. Power is mystique. Power is the uncertainty of what your limits are. And when you begin to de demonstrate limits militarily or economically, other nations um, are less motivated by that. Um, in the, when I look at superpower relations and how they, or superpower status in the world, there are four dimensions I typically look at, militarily, economically, uh, morally and institutionally. And if you look at where America has sort of begun to try to move the needle in these various areas and ask yourself in 2014, where will we be? Militarily, we have two kind of uh, conflicting trends. One is we're drawing down from things where there's been a lot of hemorrhage and over, and over deployment in my view, and we're trying to sort of uh, 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 show that we're going to be engaged uh, more deeply in Asia. Uh, Kevin Rudd, who is the former Prime Minister of Australia, I'm hosting him tomorrow at lunch if I get back to Washington, uh, has said that you know what the pivot of US military forces in Asia will look like is status quo, because we're drawing down somewhere else, and given the budget cuts, given the, the, the you know, despite the budget deal we have now, there's incredible uh, uh, downward pressure on the Defense Department right now. And so the ability to kind of, you know, throw more ships or more planes 
and to kind of create a visual, tangible military presence is going to look like no shrinkage, but not much net added uh, in Asia. It's one of the, the interesting uh, uh, conflicts. So on a relative basis, we'll be less deployed in the Middle East and probably keep uh, where we're at in, the, in there. But the, but the notion of military overstretch is diminishing. And that's probably a good thing uh, in terms of the eyes of the rest of the world, that America is getting a bit of its mystique. If you went around to India, Indonesia, Malaysia, England, France, um, you know, 13, 14 years ago, they, any, anyone in the world would, would kind of scratch their head and say, we can't believe that America has any limits, that it continues to, you know, uh, pull a rabbit out of the hat economically or militarily. You're a country that has no bounds or limits. After 9-11 uh, and after Iraq and Afghanistan, the, that sense of limitlessness that America had has dissipated significantly in the eyes of much of the world. We can talk about that later in, in uh, uh, when we get to, you know, a, a broader discussion. But I think that Obama is moving us largely in the right direction of, of diminishing the sense that we're overstretched militarily. Economically, I, the 2000, uh, 2008-2009 financial crisis, subprime crisis, was staggering in terms of its negative hit on American prestige and power in the world. We used to be the coach, the guide, the nudge to every economy on how they should organize themselves. And so if that was our real power, was how we managed our economy and how well we did it. When that went global, it diminished our ability to tell other uh, uh, economies how to do it. And since that time, you've seen a massive rise in the tendency towards state capitalism, the renationalization of core industries, the lack of trust, if you will, in some of these core sectors. I think it's amazing that we've just gotten a, a WTO deal uh, uh, in the World Trade Organization. It's the first good news we've had in a long time. We may get a Trans-Pacific Partnership or TPP uh, trade deal uh, done eventually. But largely, the United States does not, does not have the same clout and footprint in that arena that we used to. When we begin seeing demand come back, and when we see uh, uh, America begin solving not only its public sector debt problems, but its private sector debt problems, which we can, we can discuss, I think we'll, we will get back like we are in the military, begin to sort of see ourselves swell back up in being able to be more economically influential than I think we today. Um, this is very controversial, but on the moral front, I think things like the NSA spying scandal, um, the, it's, it's kind of like a, a what we had with the warrantless wiretaps times 10. I mean, it's a very controversial issue. I think this, when the, in the Cold War, many of you remember the Cold War, there's just no way the things that we're seeing today would have happened then because we positioned ourselves as a nation to be very proud of core issues in our DNA that we were about to be the opposite of what was happening in the Soviet Union or in places that controlled the travel freedom they were spying on their people, et cetera. And so whether we believe we're doing that or not, the rest of the world thinks we are. And so our beacon on the hill element has diminished somewhat. I think that Obama is trying but failing uh, to get his call. You know, with the Edward Snowden affair, you know, Obama comes out on one hand and says, we really need to have the discussion that he uh, kicked off. But at the same time, of course, you know, he, he, he raised, I mean, he's both hero to some and traitor uh, to others. And sometimes in my mind, he's hero on one front because we should have known about the wireless to the, you know, with the uh, uh, eavesdropping, but he's clearly on the traitor side when he's exposed so many other elements of on the uh, national security. But nonetheless, the massive expansion of official secrecy uh, under Obama administration, which ran, you know, in, in uh, a different direction than he had committed to when he ran for president has been a very debilitating issue in, in his, and I think that moral dimension continues to be a problem globally. And, and I tell you, the fourth element, which the United States has a lot more latitude but is not showing great leadership, is in the institutional relationships it has in the world. This would be a good opportunity in 2014 because when you see this chaotic world with Biden and Hagel and Susan Rice and John Kerry, and uh, even uh, uh, Obama himself, racing around the world to react to problems and to let the world know we're really not gone, what would be a better way to deal with that? Well, in my view, getting a new global social contract with many other nations would be a smart way to do that. Get responsible nodes of power. That's where if Iran comes in. If you get a, a deal with Iran, which you know this is a long way up, say we did get a deal with Iran, and that were the, you know, the the toe in the door to a potential normalization track to responsible behavior on nor uh, by Iran, where they began to cease and desist in their uh, transnational 
funding of transnational terror groups in the region, both not, not only in the Middle East, but you know, in Africa and other places in the world, that would be an incredible contribution to global security if you could arrange that. If you brought in India, if you brought in Turkey, if you brought in Brazil, you brought in Nigeria, you brought in other key players that were growing economically, but, but largely were going to become, carry more of the regional burdens for stability, uh, market openness, et cetera. Well, for them to do that in any kind of synthesized way or any kind of way that's, that's, that's coordinated, you need to find ways to bring them into, into uh, the global deal-making table. You need to kind of find a way uh, to have them coordinate, be brought at the table. But right now, the US and Europe in particular have votes stacked up so much in their favor that there's great fear that if they begin opening up a lot of the arrangements, whether it's the you know, IMF and the World Bank and the UN and, and, and many of the, the second tier international architecture organizations are very much built around a kind of a post-World War II consensus on who the big players were and how they would operate. There's got to be a revision of that. And I've argued that the United States and Barack Obama in particular um, are well suited to be the architect of a new global order and a new global, de global deal. And by being that architect, we would preserve a lot of the latitude and prestige of taking the world into a very different, different place. Because what you see coming is one that's very chaotic, a very chaotic world that is going to come apart because these institutions no longer fit the power realities. And people talk about the G20 having risen. That was a momentary blip in new institutions, where now G20 has fairly much slipped back from uh, uh, significance. Let me just quickly run through some things. I've tried to throw a lot of, of, of countries and, and whatnot in a, in a quick thing. When you look at what's going to happen in 2014, in my view, this will be the, uh, you know, some journalists say, here are my predictions for the next year, and then they, you know, look at the next year and they were really wrong. Um, I suspect that, uh, let's just tell some zingers. If Obama succeeds, the Congress right now considering United Nations sanctions or you know, sanctions against Iran um, a new round, that can be helpful in the negotiations process with Iran if Congress doesn't pass them, but just acts like they might or they're at the edge. But that's a dicey thing. Robert Menendez is not a big fan of Barack Obama lately. Robert Menendez is the Democratic chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. We often blame the Tea Party, we blame those, you know, the, the Obama administration will blame the Republicans or this, but it is a Democratic senator from New Jersey who's very wrapped up in his uh, lineage from Cuba and, and a kind of anti-Castro thing through which he, his lens is shaped on things like Iran and whatnot. And Menendez is not too thrilled with the eye-to-eye -eye handshake that Barack Obama just had with Raul Castro. And so the, the question is whether he can control, the White House can control that effort where Ro Robert Menendez has been allying himself with people like Lindsey Graham and John McCain more and more on these, on these sanctions issues. If that breaks and goes in, we will see the imposition of sanctions and the effort to basically then take Iran onto a very different track is over. And that means that the United States will have sabotaged the biggest potential strategic leap that has had in probably 20 or 30 years to change the way global gravity works. Iran, I, I wrote an article on Barack Obama after the first year in his office giving him a failing grade in foreign policy because I said in grading Obama only Iran matters. That when you look at foreign policy it's so chaotic, so many things are going on that you need to look at how you're going to shape your relations with the Russians, how you're going to shape your relations with the Chinese, what is your investment in Afghanistan really ought to look like if you're trying to uh, influence Iran. Are you weakening yourself? Are you strengthening yourself? So if you prioritize around that and you can show, you can shape the international system, that's power. And that has great echo effects in many other parts of the world. Um, if he could have delivered on Middle East peace, Israel-Palestine peace, which he failed to do. That was an area where he invested a lot. He gave three UN General Assembly speeches on it. He appointed uh, 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 U.S. George Mitchell to be his envoy. He also appointed Dennis Ross to be his other envoy. They hated each other. One was in the White House, one was in the State Department. They undid each other. But in the process, Obama chose the Israel-Palestine issue as a defining issue for himself and lost. And that had echo effects on the perception of President Obama's competency and his power. And in my view, had he succeeded in that, it was never